Hey, so this is a joint work with Amr Sabri and Gerardo Ortiz from Indiana. Let's dive right in. So the basic idea is, uh, and, and we started doing partial evaluation, and we realized we didn't even need that. Um, we can apply the techniques to quantum circuits, and sometimes it just works. Uh, and, and we were kind of surprised. We, we were expecting to evaluate really small circuits and, and be a horrible mess, and, and that's not what we found. So at the heart of quantum circuits are reversible circuits. So we have to start there. Um, so at the top left, we have a reversible gate, um, all composed of controlled not gates. So the plus things are not. And so the first gate basically reads the value of A0 and B0. And if A0 and the, the CX is at the right, if it's, if it's false, it doesn't do anything and, and passes everything through. If it's true, then it does a, uh, a, a not. And so all of these are controlled not gates. And if you have more than one gate, um, line on which you read something, these are Toffoli gates or generalized Toffoli gates. You can take multiple things that you add together to decide whether you actually do a knot or not. So the convention, like we write our circuits with the inputs vertical, uh, but then we write our traces with the inputs horizontal. That's just the way people do it in quantum. Um, and so if you take you know, false, true, 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 and you run it through the circuit, you get the, the, the first thing, and so on. The neat thing about these circuits is they can be run backwards. I could take the output and, and go the other way around, and all quantum circuits are, because of physics, that way. Because you can't lose information at the low level of physics. So reversible circuits are super important for all quantum, um, and, it, and, and the Toffoli gates are super important. Now, most quantum circuits are going to introduce additional gates, in particular the Hadamard gate uh, here with an H, and what it does is superposition. This is where quantum gets scary, um, and it takes, for example, false, and it produces, oh, my output is going to be half the time false, half the time true. And because essentially we're in an L2 norm, half is 1 over root 2. Uh, because uh, 1 over root 2 squared plus 1 over root 2 squared is 1. So, so yeah, these weights, you get square roots everywhere. But basically, it's the uniform distribution over true and false is the way you want to think it, of it, and a weight. So those two top two wires, you end up in some superposition state, which basically says, if somebody tries to look, I'm going to randomly give them one of those four values. And what you observe is really, it's truly random um, after you've done Hadamard. But it's kind of uniformly random, any of those that you don't know. So you go, hey, well, so if you run the circuit, then you get these superpositions. But it's, it's the same thing as before. You just put all the ors together. And so you go, well, if it's going to be a uniform superposition that says, I don't know what my value is, that's a symbol. Why don't I replace that scary quantum thing by just putting in a letter? Uh, so that's what I've done on the circuit here. And, and now you run it. Uh, and my X and Y are true or false, but I know how to do logic symbolically. And so I know how to, to do AND, and I know how to do XOR, and you run the circuit, and there's the answer. And you can see the superposition. In, in the first two lines, we get X duplicated. So we know that the first line and the last line are equal. And, and this is not random at all. This is what makes quantum work. 
that, that you end up entangling things and having equalities between different qubits being pushed through. But here, we're just using symbolics to do the same thing. And, and we like algebraic normal form. It's just like super basic logic. We know how to do this. We even know how to do it pretty quickly. So, um, great. Does that get us anywhere? Um, so, a whole bunch of quantum circuits look the same. They have two input lines, uh, a whole bunch of vectors at the top, a whole bunch of vectors at the bottom. Um, the ones at the top are all untangled. They're fed in a great big box, um, which is reversible. You measure the bottom ones. You do a Fourier transform on the top, and you measure that. Is is you see that a whole lot, and the way the the reversible box in the middle is usually done is actually you take the inputs, the x's, and you push them right through. You don't change them at all. You only read them, and you take the inputs at the bottom and you XOR them with an arbitrary function f. Lo and behold, that's reversible all the time. So you take an absolutely arbitrary function and you make it reversible by remembering your inputs so you can undo it. It's, it's, you know, it's not that hard. But the H here sort of introduces parallelism that lets you run things in parallel, like a whole bunch of stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go symbolic instead. Uh, but we're going to throw in one more trick. So normally, you uh, run your circuits. But if you look at barrier 2, we only measure the bottom. We do stuff later. So, and, and we know that u is reversible. So what we can do is I kind of run it part of the way, look at some of our outputs, throw them out, replace the other outputs by symbols, run our circuit backwards, and now we're going to get a set of constraints on the, what the outputs, sorry, what the inputs ought to be for us to get back to where we were. And then if we're lucky, those constraints are actually going to tell us what the circuit does. So, yeah, that's kind of sneaky, right? We really are using the fact that the circuits are reversible because we're going to run them backwards. Okay, so if you open up your textbook on quantum theory, uh, at the beginning there's going to be a whole bunch of algorithms with those names. All names of people, therefore they make no sense whatsoever. You just learn to pattern match. Oh, Deutsch created this algorithm. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, 1, 2, and 5, 6. And I'm going to explain them a little bit, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. Uh, so, the Deutsch problem is about balanced function. So, Boolean function is balanced if it outputs, like on all inputs, the same numbers of zeros and ones. And the Deutsch problem is, given a function, can you figure out if it's constant or if it's balanced? Well, in some sense, it doesn't seem so hard. You just run it multiple times, like twice, and you look. Quantum problem says, can you do it by running it only once? And quantum says, yes, I can do that. The Deutsch-Schirsa problem says, actually, you get n bits. Can you solve the same problem? And, and often, like, so, you know, for 8 bits, there's like 256 possible input values that you could run. And you might need to run it 256 times to figure out. Because you need to count up the bits. It, with a quantum computer, typically you need to run it five or six times, and that's enough to get you the answer. That's completely crazy, right? Uh, right. Uh, what we're going to do is solve Deutsch uh symbolically by running it once, and we're still going to get the answer. Um, the Grover problem is uh, n bits. It represents 
be a number, and only one of them is going to give you a one, like a true, everything else is false. Um, so, so normally, if you want to guess a number, you need to run everything, because you could be unlucky, and then not, never know. Uh, again, here, uh, we can do it in one go. Um, sure, the sure problem is the most famous ones where you use um, quantum algorithms to factor really quickly. So I won't explain all the details, but basically the setup is quite similar. Right. So, yeah, that's the setup. And then we wrote a whole lot of code, lots of code, um, and realized that we were writing the same code over and over again. And I said, okay, let's, let's write some good code instead of just writing a whole lot of code. So you write down some requirements. What should our code do? Well, we had a whole bunch of different representations of Booleans. That's ridiculous. Like, we, we should be abstract over that. Uh, same thing with formulas. We had a whole bunch of representations. Let's, let's make sure our, a lot of our algorithms can be abstract over that. We don't care. Um, and, and we need to be able to run forwards and backwards and symbolic in, in, in with real values and so on and so forth. And I don't want separate code for all of that. I just want one piece of code to do that. Um, I want to write down my circuit once and then run it all these different ways. Like, why would I have to write my circuits a whole bunch of different times? Um, so, so, like, make sure the polymorphism works. Um, right, some of the problems require oracles, meaning um, I'm going to specify my Boolean functions in a particular way, and now I need a circuit. And, and creating the circuits is a real pain. So great, take a textbook, write the synthesis algorithms. There's tons and tons of them out there. But it ought to generate a reusable circuit that works for any representation. So I need to make sure to write my algorithm in a very generic way. Yeah, it can be done. Um, and, then, and then if the circuits aren't too big, the thing shouldn't take hours to run, and it should, it should be all right. So you, at some point, you need to optimize a little bit. Um, so can we do that? So for those of you who know finally tagless will be massively unsurprised, uh, unsurprised that I've used it. Um, if you want to be generic over representations of values and you're a Haskell programmer, you kind of pulled that out. Uh, so uh, zero, one, not, and is is the basic stuff you need. Uh, and nary and is useful too. And once in a while you want to optimize it, you throw it in the class as well. Uh, and we have four implementations of that. One numeric, four symbolic, it's a three symbolic. Uh, so it's really useful to have a class uh, for that. Uh, for formulas and representing variables in them, um, we didn't go with a class because we found that it could pretty much never be inferred. It, it wasn't useful at all. Um, so we actually made it an actual record. And, and so here there's a like, design, right? Which way do you go? It's possible to go either way. You try it out and, and then you decide, okay, uh, uh, is it useful to have a class or an interface or just no, no, like force people to hand it to me instead of have the compiler guess it for me. Um, so three implementations. The first unbelievably naive one, our variables are going to be strings. Um, a bunch of ands are going to be lists. And below that, a formula is going to be a bunch of xors of ands, just monomials, the simplest way you can think of them. And then we don't normalize them when we do stuff. So when, when you and a whole bunch of stuff, you just concatenate the list. Yeah, it's great for debugging. It works. It's going to be really slow. You're doing like so much work that is useless here. It's ridiculous. Uh, but if, it took a while for our benchmarks to even notice that we were using the dumbest possible implementation. 
Um, so once they started noticing, okay, so why don't we use uh, integers to like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for our variables and then our monomials with ands are going to be a set of those and we, we're going to keep them ordered. So to combine them, uh, we, we, we union those two maps and then we're going to be smart and um, we're going to use uh, occurrence maps for the XORs because uh, pretty often you get, uh, oh, this monomial appears, oh, it appears again. So XOR of that, they disappear. Oh, it appears again. Oh, no, it, it needs to come back in. And then taking monomials in and out, in and out, in and out all the time is just, like for, for functional data structures, really, really bad. So don't. Just keep a count. And then at the end, if it's odd or even, make it zero or one. Much faster. Um, and then I put the compare on the screen because that's very often the bottleneck. A lot of the time is spent actually uh, comparing things because down below we have a map and inserts and everything, like tons and tons of compares happen. So if you can make that faster, it's better. This was still not quite fast enough. So we went to bitmaps. So we use actual you know, natural numbers to represent uh, a bunch of variables or, or ors, and now and is just a bit or. Fast. Machines like bitwise ors of natural numbers. Uh, and we keep the rest, and this got, this was pretty nice. And of course, there's more stuff to go, but it's all, like, this is the, the, once you have this core idea, the rest of it is straightforward. And these three implementations are, of course, instances of the rest, so we can swap in them in and out and just compare. Uh, yay. So, okay, first I'm going to give you some results, then some timings. Um, so, Deutsch USA, which is um, like decide whether it's balanced or constant. Big circuit, doesn't really matter. Let's run it on guessing that it's going to be zero. If it's constant, the formula you're going to get the constraint between the inputs and the output is either going to be 0 equals 0, at which time, yes, it was constant 0, or 1 equals 0. No, never is. It's the other one. Um, even thousands of gates, but you tricked it, it's a constant gate, you get that answer. Small. Um, if it's balanced, it looks like, you know, other things, constraints on the inputs that say, if that's the case, then yep, that was the balance case. You know it's balanced if you see a variable in the output. You don't need any more information than that. That's how we tell. In the middle, you see now in red, a great big uh, six variable like constraint thing. What is this bizarre thing? Um, it's a cryptographically strong function, which is balanced, but it's really, really hard to tell that it's balanced. And that's one of the ones that comes out. And it just pops right out. Um, Grover, guess the bit. So here it's for two to the four, like four bits. And, and the bits can be 0 to 15. And the constraints are, you know, here's, here's what it could be. But in red is the answer you want. Um, and it's always going to be in the front. And it basically says, uh, say, for u equals 6, you know, uh, bit 1 and bit 2, kind of from 0, are on. And I have to eliminate all the other possibilities. So I'm going to XOR with a whole bunch of stuff that says it's only that one and not the other ones that also have those two bits. And so if you want no bits on, that's the first case, it's the worst possible one. It's false, and it can't be any of the other things, which is why the last one is the simplest. 
Uh, but uh, in some sense, if you optimize and are super lazy, then if you can manage to get the head of this order term, you win. So you can do Grover really fast. If you're, and, and we haven't optimized it quite that much. Um, same thing for sure here is for factoring 15. Uh, you, you, you're computing a to the x mod 15. Depending on a, you get different residual equations, which give you a different uh, period for the thing that you pass to the QFT. But once you have a period, then that's enough for factoring. So whether I get period 2 or period 4, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, and, and, and the equations are small. Um, for factoring 15, there's a circuit with four gates that you can hand optimize. Uh, if you generate it using the textbook algorithms, you get 56,000 gates. This result is run on 56,000 gates because it doesn't matter. It, it, it works. If you try to factor that, you get 4 million gates, and it still works. 4 million gates. Who'd have thought of partially evaluating a program with four million statements? Most people would be kind of afraid of that. Um, but it doesn't always work. This, these work because the period is a, uh, a multiple of two. When the period is not easily expressible as a factor of two, then things go crazy. Talk about that in the end. So I'll still have time. Yes, yeah, so, okay. Right, so some timings. Um, different balance functions uh, at different sizes. Uh, for Deutsch Joisa, the representation doesn't matter. It's just exponentially slow. It just gets bigger. Like the, the answers, it, it, nope, yeah. Like the, the log. Log at the top and at the bottom, it's really to the end that matters. Yeah, this is just exponential. Uh, Grover, on the other hand, it really depends on the size of the answer. In fact, um, I think at the bottom, we went up to 24 bits. We don't have quantum computers with 24 bits, um, qubits. Uh, for you, with all ones, we still couldn't measure the time. Like, the, the, the granularity of, of Haskell's timing gave us zero. Um, and for the other extreme case, yeah, you can see that curve going up. It's getting bad, uh, worse and worse. Uh, and, and so the answer matters. Um, and different representations, this is where the good representation in green really matters, and, and bring that way down, lots of profiling. Uh, I only have two points, but basically uh, it, it, was, it was getting pretty bad, uh, and it was time to not take a super dumb uh, representation uh, to do more and get you know, up to 20 bits or so uh, instead of already at 12 bits taking 25 seconds. Right. So a little bit of complexity analysis. I won't go too fast. But roughly speaking, the first two steps are easy. The third step, you run backwards. Uh, the equations in the worst case can be an expo exponentially big. Uh, and, and that's the worst case, and it happens. So, so there you go. And depending on the problem, sometimes you can inspect the answer. But you can expect the equations, get your answer. It's great. Um, and in the worst case, you have to solve the equations. And that's NP-complete. So exponential plus NP-complete. Yeah, sometimes this isn't good. <laughs> um, what's surprising is sometimes how amazingly well it works. Um, and, and we don't know, right? Like we have no pattern that we've detected on when is it good, when is it bad. As far as we're concerned, that's wide open. Uh, right. So, so yeah, case by case. Um, 
Sure, we've done more stuff in the paper where we use, use trits and dits to, to get the other cases, and, and you seem to need to go there. And how to choose, I don't know yet. Um, so, so, yeah, symbolic's great. Um, and, and, and where quantum needs to run multiple times, we run it once. <laughs> but it's, that's the worst cases, right? Like, this is not magic. But it's kind of magic in some cases. Like, why? Uh, so, so our, our speculation is there's some quantum algorithms which we really aren't. Right now, we think they are, but they're not. And this gives us a hint of, of some of them. Look here. Yeah, there's probably a, a, a classical algorithm to, to do it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a very intriguing talk. So my shallow understanding of quantum circuits uh, says that these quantum circuits are usually related to some unitary, unitary matrix. Yep, and, that, that and, U is for unitary. Yeah. <laughs> Un and, underneath the hood, that's what's going on. Yeah, I see. So, but in the deep learning architecture, we already have a very various accelerators for matrix multiplications and all the operations. So can you connect them? so that we can reuse the deep learning accelerator framework for this kind of simulations? Uh, see, unitary is really, really special because in a higher dimension, it kind of sits on the unit sphere in the complex plane, and you can't go off of that at all. And, and matrix multiplication is, is optimized for dense matrices that lie everywhere. Uh, so I think the answer is no. Like it, it, it doesn't help. Plus, all of these circuits, even though the denotational semantics is unitary matrices, they're not there at all. They just don't show up. It's, it's, uh, yeah. The the unitary matrices here in the ZX calculus in QPy, they're just in the semantics. They're not in the programs you run. It's exciting stuff. What, how, how many qubits did you have in the largest program that you... How many? Qubits? Um, yeah, I think we've gone up to 24. Okay. Just because, like, uh, we wanted some timings here, yeah. yeah. Here, here we run at, at 24. Uh -huh. We haven't tried all of them for, um, in some sense, uh, well, it, it's really sure that that needs more. That that's really interesting, and uh, the barrier is the base, not the number of bits. I, I we need to know, like, we, which qubit basis we need to know, which is basically guessing the period in advance, which is cheating. So we're still working on that. Right. Uh, I, and I have a question about this thing with sure. So. Um... In my class in the fall, I, I had the students do one of the Kiskit labs where they do Shaw's algorithm, and they found exactly what you said. They're running on a quantum computer, of course, but they found exactly what you said, that when the base is two to the something, then everything is so much easier. It can scale much more. And so you, you see the same phenomenon. So did you try something a little higher, like 21 or something that's not two to the... That, that it was like... Wait, the 21 factors like stink because the period is a factor of two. Ah. It's the period, not... Uh, the period. Okay, okay. So I, I think that what, what the people were able to do in my class was two to the six, sure. That, but, but if it's not that, then uh, the numbers they can do are much... Yeah, so we factor 196,611. Yeah. And it's super, super fast. That, I, uh, and, and, but that uses... Q, that uses uh, right. Um, the thing is that three ends up period two, uh -huh. and, and so that's why it, it's one of the known fast examples. Okay. Uh, even though it's a big number, yeah. it's, it's easy for sure. Yeah. 